I have to contextualize a little bit my presentation, which for those who know my work, uh, it, it's not new. I've been working on the Reaper for so many years now. And uh, looking at these images from Italy also helped me to remember that uh, probably one of the most illegal collection today that have never been spoken even in the report of Philwin and Benedict is the Vatican collection of ethnography. We talk about 90,000 objects that have been until now kept at the Vatican. But, and I did a project on that in 2007 called Disposition that was shown at the Salzburg Museum with Sabine Breitbizer who is here. But tonight, um, or today, I, I don't want to speak about that. I, I really want to share with you the sort of uh, Sisyphean or Sisyphus aspect of the Reaper, in the sense that I think the Reaper carries its also paradox. It's an oxymoron. Think about the Reaper as an oxymoron. The, the Reaper is also the uh, irreparable. Before my research on ancient injured object of Africa and the rest of the world, preserved mostly in Museum of Western Technology, uh, Ethnology, sorry, I had already started to become interested in objects which in their restorative process have recycled a detail, partial or complete, directly from the so-called modern Western world. For a long time, I have observed in Algeria and Congo Brazzaville ways of recycling old material to unpredictable goals and yet that made sense on secular or sacred objects. A Bakongo statue that has lost one eye has been repaired with a brass, up holstery nail. Another Nkisi Bakongo fetish whose magic charge is traditionally placed on the belly of the statue was created with a bottle of whiskey. A Belgium colonial hat made of wood a sumptuous embroidery de raffia loincloth, a luxury item of princess from the Bakuba royal court in Congo, was repaired with a small piece of Vichy cloth, probably from a Western settler shirt. What characterizes reappropriation is the act of using an object for it, its aesthetic, certainly, but especially by its symbolic power of restoration. Indeed, there is reappropriation because there has been dispossession. Can we go to the slide two, please? <coughs> In Algeria for seven years, during the war of independence against France, my paternal grandmother collected the old jewels given to her by women from farms in all mountainous regions in order to support the resistance. One gave hearing the other a bracelet, the other a necklace, and all these objects were accumulated in a cave near our family farm, then melted into silver bullion in order to be sold to buy weapons for the resistance. That's how I first became interested in verbal jewelry from Algeria. Then, from the ethics of, the, of this story, I carefully observed the aesthetic aspect of these precious objects. And to my great surprise, I discovered that they were all made with some or even several coins representing either the leader of the empires that colonized them or their political motto, like the French Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité. We can go to slide eight now. Repair is an oxymoron because injury is its raison d'être, raison d'être. One cannot think about repairing something that hasn't be in, been injured. The state of the injured things, the failure, and the state of the repaired thing, the repair, are forever bound in a causal layout that, that runs in the ethical and aesthetic loop of repair. This is true for all metaphors of repair, natural, cultural, political, immaterial, and so on. For instance, repair is not necessarily closing up a crack in one on single object. It can also embody the merger of two, obje two objects from two different cultures, as we could see with objects from ancient society that have incorporated symbols of occupying forces. Again, the case of uh, 
uh, Berber Jewel incorporating coin coins representing the rulers of colonial occupants, like portrait of Napoleon or the King Leopold. Ancient societies have emancipated themselves from the social aesthetic and ethical order in which the modern Western occupying forces, feeling nostalgic of the antiquity they like to identify them with, have maintained them. We can think about Orientalism, for instance. By doing so, they have started to escape the position of victim of the humiliation led by the hegemony of technological superiority. That's why the reappropriation of the perspective from which these invaded populations have been subtracted is a repair, because bringing together two orders of production, one manual and the other standardized, one unique and the other mass produced, has never suffered from the limit imposed by mimetic mimesis. mimesis. So it shall not be limited to a mimetic symptom, symptom but seen as an act of resistance. The object is not mimed, but cannibalized and transformed, or vomited, to quote, Brazi to quote Brazilian writer Osvaldo Andrade in his Manifesto Antropophago. And until today, this unpredictable rebellion is relevant, because the incarnation of resistance cannibalizing a modern symbol of the occupant, like an Algerian Joel case, for instance, weakens the logic of restitution as a repair. On the contrary, it is leading to the possible fragmentation of the final object in two sides. The non-Westernized non -Western crafted ones would go to their original places, and the French Western standardized coins at the Museum of the Coins in Paris. Can we go to slide 34, please? <coughs> the metaphor of which repair is the name are plenty and complex. But they, have, but they all have a common denominator as soon as the difference between the modernity and pre-modernity of repair is revealed. Modernity, obsessed with erasing the injury, has promoted repair as an ideal return to the origi original state of the injured thing. The word, reparer, to repair, find, finds its origin in the Latin word reparare, to refit, to restore, to rebuild, to put back in order. Clear signifier of this obsession to erase the injury, erected by reason as the dogma of superiority on time, history, beliefs, object and beings, etc. Nowadays, we have pushed this obsession for control even further to the point that we have do not sorry, that we do not repair an object to bring it back to its original form anymore. Repair is not necessary anymore. We just have to replace it by a new one. This particularly contemporary and capitalist issue of replacement is also at stake in the restitution of despoiled goods. But of which issue this question is the name? How and above all, why could thousands of ancient art objects from non-Western cultures stored in Western ethnography museum be replaced by copies in resin or plastic looking perfectly identical? As this is often claimed by Western pro-restitution voices as a type of way to repair the void this return will leave. <coughs> To understand what the issue of pure and simple replacement is problematic, like in our contemporary capitalist world, in which there is no repair anymore but replacement instead, it is necessary to draw a genealogy of art objects from enslaved and colonized ancient cultures that are, until today, stored in Western museums. First of all, this issue, this issue has to be humanized. Because objects are not objects, they are subjects first. They have existed in a bodily reality that used to rule them through a correlation in which the individual body and the social body of the society they belonged to were interdependent of the object. Any object, would it be sacred or secular, has been created and sculpted by an individual. When a, sac when a sacred object, it has been charged with the, with the belief of the social group it belonged to. 
ritualized in a common and daily functionality for everyday life objects, or an exceptional one for sacred objects. They were in any case also interdependent subjects of the social order they, he they helped to maintain. As soon as they have been taken from their community, either by fanatic missionaries or selfish intellectual, or selfish intellectual, it's funny that it make a noise when I said selfish intellectual. <laughs> as soon as they have been taken for, from their community, either by fanatic missionaries or selfish intellectuals, like it is described in Phantom Africa by Michel Leris, for those who have read the book, or forever destroyed in auto da fe, like the Capuchin missionaries did it in Congo, they have left a void that, like a phantom limb, will handlessly demand a return to their original community. Can we go please to the, the slide 36, which shows uh, this image of uh, another film I did on the, on the question of the object. We are here, just, just to, it's important to mention that this is the Ethnographic Museum of the University of Coimbra, which is a university, university museum. It's not open to the public. So you have here, I mean, centuries of collection of artifacts that have been studied by students only from this amazing, very old university. The huge quantity of ex expropriated objects that is still present in Western ethnographic museums and which have been brought there directly from villages is in a mirror effect of the phantom limb left in situ and which demands the return to the native land, the part torn away amputated of these collective and individual bodies deported to another space and time, the one of a contemporary relic. I have to also quote here very quickly the conversation I had with Felwin Sarr, the, one of the authors of the report, because Felwin was mesmerized by the film I did on the phantom limb, using this sort of uh, a psychological and surgery phenomenon to, 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 to claim the return of the object. Here, I'm reversing it. I mean, I agree with Felwin, but I think the complexity of the question of the, of the restitution should be completely ambivalent. Uh, amputated to this collective, uh, uh, deported to another space and time, the one of a contemporary relic. Why a relic? Can we go to slide 38, please? During the Middle Ages, the Western world used to be obsessed with relics of saints, bones, hair, for instance, as early as 1164, the bones of the, th of the three kings have been transferred to the Cathedral of Cologne in Germany by Frederick I and have remained there until now. Like any African mask or fetish, relics in the Middle Ages would bring spiritual strength and would keep societies tight against inside and outside enemies. Some relics would attract huge crowds. They were coveted and wars would be declared to get them. It is at that point crucial to remember the most macabre dispossession in colonial history, the deportation of human remains, bones, and skulls. Taken from a uh, resistance fighter against colonialism everywhere within the colonial empire, from Algeria to New Caledonia, from Senegal to Congo, and still stored, sorry, still stored in French Musée de l'Homme in Paris until today. Yes, it is. Even if President Macron said in December 17, je souhaite que la restitution des crânes soit décidée, je le déciderai, je suis prêt, I wish that the restitution of skulls be decided, I will make it happen, I'm ready, nothing has happened since then. On April 18, 2018, Algerian historian Ali Farid Belkhadi counts 536 Algerian skulls in the, Pari in the Par Parisian museum storages, lost among the collection of 18,000 skulls of Musée de l'Homme, the decapitated heads of Algerian resistance fighters have long been forgotten. His work revealed hundreds of skulls in these storages, which had be long, sorry, which had belonged to resistance fighters against French colonization in the 19th century. Among these skulls. Anonymous people lay next to war chiefs, like Sheriff Bourbarla, initiator of the local revolt in 1851, or Sheikh Bouzian, who held the siege of Sahatcha during four months in 1849. 
The cult of relic is the appropriation of power by proxy of storing the other's body. We are talking a lot about the body yesterday, and I was mesmerized by this uh, analogy we can trust between the flux of energy and migration and people in the world and the flux that happens inside the body. But there is a, 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 a crucial aspect to understand how much the, 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 the body within this sort of uh, unconsciousness of appropriation and domination is, is at the core uh, a stake of, of, of domination, uh, like treasury of war. The cult of relic is the appropriation of power by proxy of, the st of storing the other's body. That's why human remains stored in French Museum were resistant fighter against colonial hegemony. War chiefs like these Algerian or also the Caledonian Atai, very, very famous warrior chief, and the Maori warrior skulls, etc. The list is very long. Even if relics were often made of human remains, hair, teeth, bones, etc., they were above all metaphorical prosthesis. In pre-modern time, during centuries, we know that a big part of population was amputated, of a finger, a leg, an arm. Prosthesis were a second nature of the body. Can we go to slide 50, please? A society in which amputation was common was a society in which the culture of prosthesis was normal. Crutches, wooden leg, fake wooden hands, etc. Over centuries, prosthesis have imprinted the Western collective unconscious through modernity and until now. What does the huge quantity of object brought directly from non-Western world, dominated by the Western world, and kept in its museum storages, show, if not the continuity of a belief in the prosthesis repairing an absence, a, defi a deficiency inherited from the Middle Ages and that gave birth to the cabinet of curiosity. The Western obsession for accumulating elements of social cohesion, like artworks or cult objects from other cultures, can be linked to the power of some artifact, like, for instance, the famous just justice mask from the Gere people in Ivory Coast that would be brought out to solve the community's dispute. Ancient artworks taped in Western Museum have been uprooted, creating a phantom limbs that endlessly call for their return from Occident. They have therefore become prosthesis of an, intellect, of an intellectual and artistic scene that facing the opacity of the modernity of a world submitted to technological progress had kept them away from the immaterial field of creations. Can we go to the last slide, 66? The unknown forces of which these objects were the guardians and their unpredictable aesthetics have been un unhoped for prosthesis for the modern Western intellectual. Intellectuals, artists, have indeed felt amputated from the invisible and unknown world through the age of reason and would be connected to the unpredictable via these objects and the belief of which they are the legacy. I cannot stop here and remind you that in 1936, right in this place, there was the first exhibition ever, massive exhibition, where artifact and modern art were exhibiting together long time before the exhibition of the 80s. And this is very important to understand that the MoMA at this time did not do this by philanthropy. The MoMA wanted to be part of this international conversation by being a little bit more avant-garde than the, the European Museum. The 1936 exhibition is extremely important. I hope I'm not missing the date, but it's the 30s, this I'm sure. Uh, the prosthesis humbodied by these objects have allowed a kind of augmented reality. So here we are. Long before the algorithm used today to make it possible to access another reality through our screens. It's always fascinating to imagine Braque, Picasso, especially those who were looking at African masks and, 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 and watching something else that the other people could not.
What seems to be different between yesterday and today is that when Picasso was watching an African mask or sculpture and elaborated a revolution of representation in the Western art he belonged to, he had no electronic device between his eye and the object, but only his predator genius agency. The extra reality this art was carrying helped him and still help us to see differently and then strengthen our way of thinking together the otherness. Without justifying who we are and who are, are the other, so we back again into what Glissant called the right for opacity. A right for opacity because the essence of, of what has been taken will never be returned. Thank you very much. <laughs>